welcome everybody. Um, my name is Nadia Kostiuk. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan. I'm also a pre-doctoral fellow in cybersecurity policy here at Fletcher. Um, we're going to start in a very exciting panel, continue the conversation that we started yesterday on weaponized interdependence. This panel will dwell on the topic of cybersecurity. In particular, we will explore the two questions um, that um, try to shed light on, on, on these, these two questions that I mentioned in the program. Specifically, can cyberspace um, have a choke point effect? And given that the states are now experimenting with segmenting the internet, will the strands initiate weaponize interdependence or simply distribute network centrality to multiple actors? And I have here right next to me an excellent group of experts um, that uh, will provide their rem remarks um, just in a few seconds. To my immediate left, we have Susan Landau, who is the British Professor in Cybersecurity and Policy at the Fletcher School and at the School of Engineering at the Department of Science at Tufts. Um, then we have Pasha Sharikov, uh, who is a research fellow in the Institute of US and Canada Studies of the Russian Academy of Science. He focuses on American politics in general and cybersecurity in particular. Then we have Dr. Uh, Martha Finmore, who is a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. And then we have um, Dr. Natasha Tusikov, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Science at York University in Toronto. And so I'll give uh, everybody between, I guess, eight and 10 minutes, up to 10 minutes to provide your remarks. And I'm gonna, I'm not too sure what kind of signal I'm gonna be waving fingers um, since I don't have really deep voice to <laughs> to stop everybody. So you can point at me and I can do that too. All right, I'll yes. do like this and then <laughs> the signal to stop. Uh, so Susan, here you go. Um, so I'm the ringer in the room. I'm the uh, person who was trained as a computer scientist and about 20 years ago, I started doing policy issues, um, but I still think like a scientist. So I think in I don't want to say in bits, but I tend to think a little bit more black and white than social scientists. But more, I think uh, that's uh, I have learned to to think gray. But but more to the point, I think a lot about the technology and and how the technology. I I think of the technology is quite central. So as I I read Henry and Abraham's paper. Um, and I was really impressed with lots of interesting ideas there. I was also thinking about, well, what does it really say about the technology and what is the technology doing that, that, that may completely upend what they're thinking about? And I thought a lot about the issue of centralization and decentralization in, uh, in computing. I started to compute, and you can see that from, from my gray hairs, uh, everything was time sharing. Uh, you were on a machine and you had a, a terminal and you connected to some some other machine and you got a little bit of that other machine every of a second and there were other people were using the other machine and while it might look that you were doing things locally you weren't and then technology the price of, of processors and so on dropped and we got desktops and laptops um, and then the price of bandwidth dropped and networking dropped and the price of storage dropped so it's it's not a well-known thing to most people you know that price of processes or the price of, of machines drops quite a lot. Uh, uh, it, the, the speed doubles every 18 months is the, is the rule we know. Uh, but it's less well known uh, outside the industry that the price of storage drops uh, even faster than, uh, than the price of, uh, of computation, at least for the last 20 years or so. And what that's led to is a centralization in cloud computing. So you're doing less computation on your highly capable devices um, because instead it's cheaper to do it in cloud. Um, I don't know where technology is going to lead us. There's lots of arguments um, that say the cloud is going to become increasingly important, and that's true from a business point of view, a business, and not have to invest in lots of machines. You can invest in only the amount of machines you need. And if next week your business doubles and the week after it increases by 10, which happens for some startups, the lucky ones, you don't have to go and rush out and buy new servers. You just buy some more space on Amazon Web Services. There's a strong argument for why cloud computing is going to continue to be quite important, at least for industry. Um, there are reasons why for the individual cloud computing is important. It's a lot easier to use Google search for your email than it is to, to search your email locally. 
um, on your on your device. Um, so there are arguments towards the kind of centralization that this paper is talking about. Uh, but at the same time, I want to say I think we're looking at a snapshot in time. If I go back to 2000, there were almost no Chinese on the internet. 770 million Chinese on the internet. We still tend to think the internet as dominated by Europe and 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 um, North America. That is not true any longer. The number of Asians on the internet is higher than the number of Europeans and Americans on the internet. And the internet is changing. English was the most popular language on the internet uh, 15, 20 years ago. Not true now. Let's turn to the paper itself, having set a bit of context. On the paper itself, I would say that SWIFT works because other nations find it useful. Rise works because the other participants find it useful. In 2008, the Swedes very rapidly passed a law on surveillance that said any communication that has at least one end outside Sweden are tapped without a, a, a search warrant, without going through a legal process. I have to tell this audience why Sweden might pass that law. Just look at geography and you'll see why it was valuable for Sweden to pass that law. Um, but Sweden passed that law because it was getting intelligence from the United States and it had to reciprocate. Uh, so that argues that, in fact, there are trade-offs happening behind the scenes. All of you know those trade-offs are happening behind the scenes, even though we can't document them. And so the question then is, well, does, uh, so the questions that occurred to me are, are there choke points on the internet uh, that the U.S. government is not using? And the answer is absolutely. If we go back to the event of Sony Pictures Entertainment. You may recall <laughs> that first the FBI and then the president said that uh, Koreans were behind it. There was a lot of doubt, including by the tech community. And then about a month after Obama said the North Koreans were behind that, there was an article published, uh, a, a leak published by Der Spiegel. Uh, it was a set of communications between uh, people at NSA and it said, uh, does anybody know whether there's any fourth party access into places? And somebody said, yes, I know of even fifth party access. Uh, the, we hopped on to the South Koreans who were in the North Korean network, and that's how we got into North Korea. And then we developed our own access into North Korea. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the discussion about uh, whether or not uh, the U.S. actually knew that the North Koreans had been the ones to hack Sony Pictures Entertainment died down. It was clear that the U.S. had that capability. What Snowden revealed, to a some extent, was the capability that the U.S. had within various networks. If it had that capability in 2013, you can bet that it has the ability to install choke points all around the globe. Is it in the U.S. interest to do so? No. But might it be at some point? depends on what the conflict is. I think for the US, if you think about cyber, the question is, how do you show, the, the issue is you may have the capability to do certain things, but how do you show that you have the weapon? There's a very interesting article by uh, Jack Goldsmith and Stuart Russell that uh, sort of flips the kinds of questions that, that Henry and Abraham were working on uh, and looks at it from a different viewpoint. What they look at is, why is the U.S. being so subject to, to cyber attacks, of large ones, small ones, nothing that's been devastating to the nation, but certainly things that have been devastating economically. And it says, and the article points out that the private sector controls, uh, uh, has the economic dominance, including in critical infrastructure, that makes it hard for the U.S. government to protect. Uh, there's digital connectedness in everyday life. It's a free and open society. It's something that that treasures, that the U.S. treasures and government transparency. It also believes in rule of law. And there's a high, as, as the paper says, high regulatory skepticism. Those make it difficult to regulate and protect. The question is whether some of those might be flipped to actually increase U.S. capabilities. Uh, one could imagine a situation where they are. 
So I'd like to stop there because what I wanted to do is rather than solve the problem is throw out all sorts of, I don't want to say alternative facts because that has gotten uh, a very bad rep in the last three years, but I want to say alternative ways of looking at the facts, alternative sets of information that is looking at the computer architecture and the things underlying the architecture and saying maybe their choke points aren't as, as maybe there are choke point effects here as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor and a big pleasure. I applaud Dan, Abe, and Henry for setting such an interesting topic for discussion, which is much more interesting than the boring discussions that I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, when I received the invitation to this uh, conference, I figured out that I have to speak about topics which are located in the intersection of three different fields. First is cyberspace, saying it is national security, and international relations. So wh whatever these three uh, is interconnect, intersect, that's the most interesting. So cyberspace is a relatively new phenomenon for international relations. It's been there for 30 years. It started as a research projects in the 70s and the 80s. The turning point was in the 90s when internet was commercialized and it became popular. And uh, right now, oh, I have a presentation and I have like a few slides possible to show. Basically, uh, coming back to your point, the uh, slides show how popular internet became in the United States, in the Western democracies at first, and how right now uh, the uh, number of users in Africa, in Asia, China, and the Middle East just skyrocket. So uh, internet penetrated to literally every scope of activity. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so uh, basically, yeah, uh, th this is the internet user statistics from 2000 to 2019. Uh, basically, the Western democracies, Western countries have already reached a very high level of internet use uh, in their society. And uh, there was some fascinating, you, you see the growth from 2000 to 2019 in Africa, 11,000 percent. In Asia, one, almost 2,000 percent. Latin America, Caribbean, 2.5 thousand percent. This uh, fantastic uh, figures that demonstrate my point. Basically, for three decades, it's now possible to look where the cyberspace is, what are the major trends of the development of cyberspace. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for, I have to switch to another slide. Uh, basically, the four uh, trends where the cyberspace is developing, first is technical, uh, technological process. I have no technical background, so all I can say is that uh, internet access is becoming more cheap, more mobile, and more fast, which brings almost half of the population of the planet online right now. Trend uh, I call individual empowerment. Not I call, I think that this topic has been raised in covering good details by a number of publications of the Intelligence Council and the Global Trends. Uh, reports. Uh, the third trend is my favorite, reflects how the government reacts to individual empowerment, to the techno technological progress. So basically there are two major, every, every government of course, every nation reacts in its own unique way, but there are two major patterns. Uh, the one pattern is how uh, the governments encourage individual empowerment, and the other pattern is how the governments basically try to limit individual empowerment through control. So here is a, a classical definition of government, according to Max Weber, that governments possess a monopoly on legitimate violence. But the fundamental, fundamental question in regard to cyberspace, what is violence in cyberspace? And what kind of violence is legitimate? And what kind of violence is illegitimate? This can be considered as uh, reasonable or unreasonable. The fourth trend relates to global nature of cyberspace. This is uh, uh, where these two patterns clash, uh, the individualistic approach versus statehood approach. And uh, these two approaches are not necessarily mutually exclusive, even though uh, none of them have ever been realized to the full extent. So basically there are two different uh, approaches that exist um, parallel. Today it's unclear which way 
the cyberspace will go further. Either it will become a global domain or it will be more fragmented or segmented, as you call it. Uh, but what we know is that it is already an inherent part of global politics, national politics, and uh, it, it would be wrong to perceive cyberspace as some sort of virtual reality, a real thing. And we know many examples how actions in cyberspace had very real consequences in real life. Uh, so uh, the implications for international relations is that in cyberspace is rarely used as the only form of oppression. Basically, if one country or one actor would like to attack another actor, it would use cyber instruments along with many other uh, forms of aggression, including military power, etc., economic power. Classical Colin for Clausewitz definition of war is achieving political goals through violence. And this is where I think the most interesting thing is who are the actors who have political goals and uh, how they use violence in order to achieve these goals. Clausewitz referred to nation states and an international system which consists of nation states. But in the era of cyberspace, the number of and the nature of these actors is changing, is growing. And uh, yeah, this is very dramatic changes. So individuals worldwide, worldwide empowered by information technologies, they have unlimited opportunities to globally pursuing and achieving political, economic, and every other kinds of goals. So, um, foreign states remain the major actors in international relations. Non-state actors tend to have increasing influence and uh, it may be exercised through cyberspace and violence and web weapons in cyberspace. And uh, the difference is that state actors are the only actors who have sovereignty. And non-state actors are not some actors that act along with states. Those are networks, as I think you uh, I, uh, said yesterday. And uh, many of these networks, they overlap with, basically those are citizens of states who unite in networks and act as separate actors, non-state actors. Uh, yeah, I was at some point thinking how to categorize actors, and I figured out that because of this overlapping, it is impossible to categorize actors into separate groups. The only separate groups are states, but uh, they, they are basically losing the monopoly on violence because these networks, their influence is increasing and they can use violence <laughs> along with the violence that the states use. The only difference is that the states remain responsible for legitimate violence and the non-state actors, they use violence which is illegitimate. And here's the question, how to counter this illegitimate violence, how to define this violence? Basically, uh, sounds really messy, and uh, but I think that uh, the political activity of these non-state actors or networks and the possibility of inflicting damage through cyberspace creates a new form of conflict, creates new forms of pathways of escalation. There's different ways of solution, basically the traditional state conflict resolution. Um, so the harder for governments to exercise their monopoly legitimate violence, but states still have to take responsibility for and ensure um, security. So uh, out of the actual debates for um, sure global stability in cyberspace or global governance, cyber governance, internet governance, there are again two opposing approaches represented by Russia and the United States at the United Nations. Basically at the end of last year there was a very interesting case when both countries introduced resolutions on internet governance in the United Nations, and both resolutions were passed or adopted. So this is a uh, number of United Nations indexes of internet use in information technologies use, and uh, the average of these indexes for the countries that supported Russian resolution and American resolution. And you can see how much different these two approaches are. So Russia and the United States are probably not as different because Russia is a, uh, a much has a better level of net use compared to the countries who supported Russian resolution. 
But uh, if you look at the two columns in the middle, you see that this gap is really huge. Uh, so yeah, this uh, also brings a different understanding of aggression, which I think is a very significant part of the current conflict between Russia and the United States. And uh, the negotiations over internet governance or the definition of cyber violence or uh, approaches to norms of responsible behavior in cyberspace. These negotiations usually fail and do not bring any specific results. So I'm going to stop here and Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for putting this together, Dan. I really am enjoying this. Um, I wanted to pick up. Well, when when uh, Dan invited me, I said yes long ago, and then I found out I was on a cybersecurity panel, and I sent him a panic phone call saying, "I don't want to talk about cyber. I have 400 questions, all of which have nothing to do with cyber." And he said, "Tough. Uh, you know, you're you're on the cyber panel, I but said, tough." <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I'm going to try to uh, sort of uh, fudge the difference here. Um, what I want to do is pick up on some of the points that Abe made yesterday about where this project might go and, and try to riff on those in the cyber context, perhaps, uh, because I think where this could go next has it's a very rich project and there are all kinds of places this could go. I got super excited. Um, Henry gave a very nice presentation, but I knew what the article said. That was what I didn't know about was where this is going to go next. So one of the interesting um, issues that you guys put on the table for the project was the, the following problem. Do these tools degrade over time? Right? If you use them, can you repeatedly use them uh, in ways it, with equal force, or is there some kind of um, change over time in the efficacy of choke points and the efficacy of this panopticon effect um, and and which feeds into your larger instinct about making this a really dynamic model because if the tools change in efficacy that's your dynamics right there and then the larger analytical question is what's going into those dynamics um, my guess is one guess is obvious that probably there's variation across empirical domains in whether how these uh, choke points or um, panopticon effects play out dynamically. Um, but the broader analytical question is, what are the mechanisms by which degradation or maybe proliferation, if Susan's right, uh, proliferation of new checkpoints, if states can engineer them or choke points, could happen? Um, so I could think of at least two, and they're probably interrelated. One is, um, there must certainly be learning effects over time by state actors, right? So if you are a target of choke point politics, can I call it choke point politics? <laughs> um, if you get targeted, um, actors are savvy, actors are creative, and they are going to develop strategies uh, in response to this. They're going to be willing to break habits, break rules, break norms to get out from under and uh, you know work around being choked and being surveilled. Um, but they're going to do that in uh, conjunction with developing developing new technologies uh, because the techno as Susan pointed out, these technologies are dynamic in all kinds of ways and actors are going to develop new technologies um, to try to counter these uh, facts. Um, and so the way these two work together strikes me as an interesting line of inquiry. So when I think about um, you know, if in the earlier days of internet politics, China felt threatened by the sort of, or coerced by this panopticon effect, this great visibility that's created by this very open structure, what's the response? The response is you build a firewall technology, uh, which is then turned out to be exportable um, with varying degrees of success. And I'd be curious, other people may know much more about how the firewall technology and the surveillance technology developed, has, has, how effectively it has traveled, how much can you do with hardware or how, how much can you do with the technology by itself and how much do you need to implant it in a social system that allows it to work. You know, if Pakistan buys firewall technology, 
work without the Chinese Communist Party to implement it in Pakistan. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how that plays out. Um, uh, the other, another um, example might <coughs> speak to a debate that came up yesterday about the chip markets. Um, the Economist, uh, I even brought it with me, the Economist has this spread on um, the risk five chip markets that um, couldn't you, if you move to an open source platform, will that start changing opportunity structures for industry and government in uh, these choke points of chip distribution? I don't know the answer to that, and I didn't find The Economist very helpful. So I'm hoping Susan's going to help me out. But there's a time horizon factor in these dynamics that would also be worth thinking about. Some of these changes, it might be that you're choked in the short term, but you know, what about the medium term and what about the long term? What what are the la what are the learning times and what are the technology development times? How do those to change over time the shape of this weaponized interdependence framework? So I, I, I like Susan, I'm sort of throwing this out there, hoping someone else will have um, good information about how we should think about the way those two things interact. The other thread I wanted to pick up on that um, is raised in the article, and um, actually we didn't talk much about yesterday, is the role of domestic institutions. Right? These are crucial in the way um, Abe and Henry lay out the argument. If you don't have the right institutions, you cannot weaponize, as the U.S. was not able to weaponize certain parts of the cyber domain because we don't have freedom of information and other things mean you can't do that. Um, but there's a larger set of domestic institutions problems that I think filters through these issues. It's not only the weaponizer or the choker or the surveiller uh, whose institutions matter. It also matters on the target side. And, and one of the things that I was cur that I'm curious about in this space is that um, when the U.S. is dominant in all kinds of fields, one of its standard ways of projecting power and coercing, or maybe you want to call it soft power, is it reconfigures the domestic institutions in other countries. This is how neoliberalism succeeds. If we want everybody to buy into our exported economic models, we reconfigure your State Department, we reconfigure your Treasury, we go in with technical assistance to do all this stuff. Um, we have been not super active trying to coercively and reconfigure the cyber regulatory apparatus around, especially in the global south. Um, and I'm kind of not sure why. I mean, there's USTTI that's running its little voluntary workshops, but they're not, they're tiny. Um, compared to what we've done in the post-45 world to reconfigure the political institutions of other countries, it strikes me that the U.S. has been, seems to my mind, rather unevangelical about domestic regulatory structures. Um, so, a, I'm not sure that's true. It's a, it's a push back on that because I, what I, I don't know what I don't know. Um, but it strikes me this is consequential for a lot of the rulemaking is that go on globally and that I do study. I mean, it is how if. As things move to global fora, when you're, you you get outcomes like the Dubai <laughs> Wicked in 2012, where the global South peels off and says, sure, let's move internet <laughs> regulation to the ITU. Seems like a good idea. One state, one vote sounds really t good to us in the global South. Um, you know, how much cyber capacity there is in those uh, some of those countries and what the decision making process is that creates those outcomes would be worth investigation. I also think that's part of the enthusiasm for the open-ended working group process as a counterweight to the GGE process at the UN. Again, this is, um, you know, these Global South countries trying to exert some power and what those institutions look like should would matter, I would think, to the coercers uh, or the panopticoners or the choke pointers who are trying to exercise power in this space. So um, those are ideas lacking any deep empirical knowledge, and I'll be delighted if someone can 
Thanks. So I'm very glad to be here today. I'm also a bit of an outsider. I'm a criminologist regulatory scholar. I'm not an IR scholar. I draw from socio-legal studies, internet governance, especially law and technology literature. I look at a lot of state, non-state interactions in the regulation of technology and how non-state actors institute and enforce rules uh, in technology, especially force of pressure from states. So one of the reasons I'm here is uh, my research certainly complements that of uh, Henry and Abe um, and their concept of weaponized interdependence. Uh, my 2017 book looks at uh, states and internet platforms and their efforts to control and exploit what I call internet choke points. And that's the title of the book. I've got to do a book plug, uh, Choke Points, Global Private Regulation on the Internet. So in this book, I look at how state actors, and this is uh, the, the great power states, the, the big states, um, the US, the EU, coercively pressure large internet platforms uh, to act as regulators. These are mostly US platforms, but it's also um, uh, the Chinese e-conglomerate giant uh, Alibaba. So I look at two types of choke points. Uh, the first type is um, choke points, making it more difficult for users to actually access uh, content that uh, governments or, or state actors don't want them to access. So choking off search marketplace and domain name services. And the second platforms enact revenue choke points. So making it more difficult for these bad actors to either generate legitimate revenue through selling goods or services or raising donations or um, uh, bad revenue from uh, advertising platforms from, from bad advertisers. Enrolling platforms as regulatory intermediaries enable states to reach beyond their traditional jurisdictional boundaries, which is something that policymakers uh, acknowledge as a very uh, important benefit and allows certain states to export their preferred standards, their preferred regulatory frameworks globally. Um, so a bit of context. So my first reaction to the article was one of familiarity, was one of recognition. Um, what uh, Abe and Henry term weaponized interdependence is familiar to me as a regulatory scholar and a scholar of internet governance. And yesterday we spent quite a bit of time talking uh, in the field of political science, politics and international relations. But what I thought was really missing yesterday was a discussion of some of the other fields that have been looking at these questions for quite a while in terms of internet governance and internet law, uh, surveillance studies. So while uh, this concept may be under theorized in international relations, uh, regulatory theory, internet governance literature has a considerable body of literature on this topic um, to explain states exploitation of um, internet communications, uh, communications technology. And there's a whole body of literature surveillance studies that looks at the different ways that states exploit surveillance to monitor and control uh, domestic and, uh, populations and other states. Uh, so I just want to, to highlight a few ideas there. So um, from the 1990s, um, we've we've had a concern about how states might exploit the budding internet infrastructure. It's a considerable topic of discussion in the internet governance literature. And um, these scholars really um, talk about the regulability. It's not a wild west. Uh, it is not something that's beyond state control. It is highly regulable. So I'm thinking of works by uh, Joel Reidenberg, 98, uh, James Boyle, 97, Michael Bernhack and Neva Elkin Corkin, 2003. Uh, Joel Reidenberg, uh, 98, uh, famously developed Lex Informatica, the rules uh, for information flow. Lawrence Lessig popularized this in 99 and 2000. To uh, the code is law, setting rules in information architecture, uh, technical architecture. And one of the key advantages um, that Reidenberg, Lessig, and Boyle note is that the jurisdiction is the network itself, right? So not the state, but the network itself. And policymakers I've interviewed from my research admit that that is the key advantage that governing through platforms that operate transnationally, you can reach beyond your traditional jurisdictional boundaries. And a second point that these scholars uh, emphasize is understanding private power in relation to the internet. These private actors that create, operate, maintain uh, private infrastructures. So all of the uh, infrastructure of the internet, but also this content layer. And third is Bernhack and Elkin Corgan argue in 2003, while the state initially took a laissez-faire, free market, self-regulatory approach, the state was was very keen in the early 2000s to move in and assert control over these centralized nodes of private power. Um, and whether this is coercing, recruiting, or assembling wallet nodes that were, were volunteering their efforts to the state. 
second point of familiarity to me was the uh, state's deliberate exploitation of privately operated infrastructure. We've seen this as a subject in socio-legal studies and internet governance studies for quite a while. Internet law scholar Jonathan Satrain, 2008, points out the long history of using these actors as gatekeepers, as private intermediaries. And I was reminded of Yoke Benkler's 2011 article about the U.S. government using for the first time a denial of service attack against WikiLeaks to achieve um, uh, uh, technical payment and business process systems to halt those systems to the targeted sites. So pusher, pushing, pressuring U.S. firms like Amazon, like PayPal to withdraw those services in the absence of any legal orders, in the absence of any legislation. The starting point of my book, these, the ability of states to coercively pressure large transnational actors that offer key technical and commercial services that without those services, you are unable to function or your capacity to function is sharply curtailed. So in line with Wyoming research, scholars like Emery Bridey, uh, Uta Cole, emphasize the regulatory power of these big, mostly US uh, intermediaries to control global flows of information and monitor actors. So I wanted to consider three key questions kind of in, in light of this um, into the question, you know, is weaponized interdependence occurring online? Yes, absolutely. And we only need to look to the US government's involvement in pushing its standards to protect intellectual property rights online, particularly copyright and trademark. This has been a long held policy of the United States in the physical world, and this has simply been transferred to the online. More importantly, maybe what areas of internet infrastructure, commercial and technical services might be most vulnerable to choke point effects. So my research certainly indicates that financial services are quite vulnerable, given the high concentration of these payment providers, PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, but along with uh, Tencent's WeChat and Alipay. Other areas of commercial or technical infrastructure might be vulnerable. Uh, cloud infrastructure is very concentrated with major U.S. companies holding key market share. We can think of Amazon Web Services, but also there's the rise of China's Alibaba and Tencent. What about domain name services, uh, content delivery network providers? And I think uh, research would be, it would be important to consider research on the physical cables, the technical infrastructure of tubes, pipes, uh, and Dwayne Winsek's work pointing out that the physical infrastructure is becoming less U.S. centric with state and private actor consortia in the Asia Pacific region, a lot of new Internet infrastructure. Second, what are possible reactions from non hegemonic? So as a Canadian, I'm very familiar with um, other countries setting rules that affect how we live, um, often using private actors. And this is especially true in regards to Internet infrastructure. Uh, as Canadians, we use the services of companies that are not our own, U.S. tech firms. And this uh, came to a head last week. There's an excellent uh, example of this, a food truck operator in Toronto selling Cuban coffee to Torontonians using the Square payment processor. And Square was blocking those payments for people buying coffee on the streets of Toronto. This is because Square, um, a payment processor, uses U.S. banks. And these U.S. banks are, of course, subject to U.S. laws considering Cuba, but this was something that the food truck operators were unaware of because they were simply selling uh, Cuban coffee in Toronto to Torontonians and uh, found that they were unwittingly uh, um, uh, obeying or being forced to obey U.S. law. But we also find how can uh, smaller countries resist? We talked about resistance yesterday and resilience when uh, these tech platforms don't uh, obey or even consider our law legitimate. Uh, recently, Facebook dismissed official findings by the Canadian government that it violated privacy law, saying it is uh, subject to U.S. law. Google recently declined to have any political advertising for our ongoing federal election, saying that the new Canadian law on electoral advertising is too complex. So we have globally operating U.S. companies simply declining to comply with Canadian law. So I think we have to think when we're talking about smaller countries, what are their opportunities for resistance, for uh, pushing back against this? And finally, uh, to end with a, a maybe a more provocative question, the concept of weaponized interdependence give us that the internet governance literature has not already articulated. Um, Reidenberg, Zetrain, Lessig, and many others have pointed out that this infrastructure is particularly regulable, is regulable in very uh, interesting ways because of the technical architecture. Elkin Corrin, Benkler, Bridie, and myself have demonstrated states do have this very keen interest and they actually are 
operating in terms of exploiting privately held internet infrastructure. And surveillance studies like David Leon uh, tells us how states tap into private actors' uh, surveillance capacities to surveil security interests. So beyond adapting uh, these ideas to international relations, what can weaponized interdependence tell us about these battles between and among states and between and among private actors when there's conflicting agendas? And when might these conflicting agendas be most likely? So I, before I open the questions, um, the open floor to the, to the audience for questions, I was wondering if any of you, Susan, would like to make some comments on each other's remarks. A few minutes. Hello. Good morning. Um, <laughs> you asked me. about China and surveillance society. My understanding is that a lot of what happened in China through the development of the firewall and, and moving on is that coercion pays, plays a great role. And you don't actually need to censor if you get people to self-censor. Um, and so, yes, there are technical means, but the self-censorship, um, um, I'll give you a di completely different example. In the United States, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, big success. You can say, look at all the loss of pri lack of privacy. But where the FTC, with its limited budget and limited has had great success is instead of having very clear rules so all the companies go right to the rule and not a moment and don't do anything better they've had unclear rules they said okay you have a privacy policy and you're a large company and you're not quite following your privacy policy big fine and the next chief privacy officer of the next company looks and says hmm maybe i better improve things and it's been a trend up rather than a trend down so between 2005 and 2015 um, there was actually an improvement in privacy in the U.S. documented by uh, Deidre Mulligan and Ken Bamberger at Berkeley in a series of papers in a book. But that kind of self-censorship has played a really big role in China. And I think part of the reason that the Chinese model doesn't get to Pakistan but may well work in a place like Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, you have to look at both the technology and what the society is. Um, the business of the Global South... Um, and uh, ITU, uh, the important aspect of ITU there is before the internet, a lot of the smaller countries got a huge amount of their budget, their national budget, the taxes on long distance phone calls. Long distance phone calls went away with the internet. And when long distance phone calls goes away, so did that piece of budget. So the idea of putting ITU regulation back on the internet is much more about money than it is about political matters, I think. Right, but, well, no, I would say money is a political matter, I guess Fine. is what I would it, say. It, right, so. but but the the, the right. press for it, while the press for it in places like Russia and China are from from different purposes, mm -hmm. the press from the smaller countries comes from, from the issue of money. Um, <clears throat> and then I just wanted to, um, to, to talk about, a little bit about Natasha's point about power. And I think the U.S. has had this funny kind of thing. It doesn't want other nations to regulate the U.S. hegemony in, in Internet providers. So it's pushed against regulation elsewhere and uh, in order to help keep um, the U.S. economic power strong in, in this area. And it's a very short-sighted, short-term kind of behavior, but, but for the moment it's been effective. <laughs> Right, oh, I had one more, which is I want to say. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you mentioned, uh, and it was a very useful point, the business of the cables and the the amount of cables being being built in Asia. I wanted to go back in history. If you go back a hundred years, where are all the cables? They go to England because of the um, the. Uh, uh, now I'm blanking on the word, but you all know the word I want. Uh, Telegraph. Sorry, right, telegraph? telegraph? No, not the telegraph. I'm not looking technically. Uh, Commonwealth. Oh, the Commonwealth. Oh. And information was power, and the UK knew it. And it's part of why the UK remains so powerful in the Five Eyes relationship, because it has such physical capability that translates into intelligence capability. Um, if you look in our world now, what is important is not manufacturing, it's IP, it's intellectual property. And who is going to have the intellectual property in the world? So moving the pipes to Asia 
is is both following where people are consuming, but eventually where people are consuming as well. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's take uh, questions. Love getting that's the first question. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you everyone for uh, your presentations. Uh, learning a lot. I guess the question I have hearing this is that you know you've been talking about two different kinds of effects for weaponized energy: choke point effect. And Marty that asked the sort of durability, like when do these capabilities degrade? And it does strike me that there's a serious difference in terms of the in terms of the probability of degradation between choke point effects and panopticon effects, because in some ways a choke point effect you don't feel until the actor actually exercises. And then once that happens, that's when you potentially have other actors trying to figure out, okay, can we resist? Can we route around it? And maybe they can't, but the point is that you would expect to see active efforts to, to overcome or overwhelm that. Whereas in theory, the panopticon effect, if it's well executed, isn't necessarily observable to the actors that are being observed. Um, and so I do wonder, does that mean that the panopticon effect in some ways these kinds of would have the capacity to endure far longer if it's you know deployed adroitly, as opposed to in some ways, the choke point effect, the moment you use that the first time, you're almost automatically trying to, to it's, it's like, uh, it's not planned obsolescence, but, it, but it's potential obsolescence. But I'm willing to be pushed back on this, by the way. Well, so, no, I think that, no, I, I, I think you're stirring this pot in a constructive way. And, and, and in a funny way, I want to maybe add, you actually sort of bring Henry and Abe into this for, for the following reason, and that I think, actually, I think states do get hot and bothered about potential. They can see the choke points. I mean, they they can see the configurations in the technology, and they do. What's all the fuss about five G about? It's it's prospective anticipation of both panopticon kinds of effects and potentially some choke point kinds of effects, or at least that's how I would read it. So, so so there's another layer, and I. I, I <coughs> Uh, given these two guys and what they've worked on for 20 years, I'm one. I was surprised this hasn't come up. These are sort of networks of trust that underlie a lot of the political reactions. I think that come, and I'm not sure how you guys want to think about this. This is a, I mean, or how you're going to think about this in the larger project, because in a happy fuzzy world where the people who have the potential choke points technology our good buddies like maybe we don't worry about them a lot and it doesn't change our behavior a whole lot but if china gets this then maybe we think about this very differently um i'm not sure how to think in your weaponized interdependence world about the networks of social and political trust that must shape crucial decision of when do I weaponize, right? When do I pull the trigger? And, and and so I don't know how that layer feeds into the larger structural argument going on here. It's a sanctions paradox argument. Sorry, but like, you know, in some ways this is the same argument I made with sanctions, which is if you're dealing with allies, you actually have tremendous leverage and you should be extremely reluctant to use it um, because it's got to be that the payoff is significant and you, know, you don't minimize your cost. So, you can do it on occasion, but if you do it too much, you will, you know, degrade that capability. Whereas with adversaries, they're going to anticipate this sort of thing, so they're automatically going to be resistant to it. And I just because Abe and I also, have, you know, as Marty says, we've been working. We've got we've got parallel streams of work here. Mm -hmm. Some of which talks to this. And part of it is a is a Marty type story. Uh, oh which is to say that so oh, dear. Yeah, oh dear, <laughs> so this, is, this is for our our book, which came out a few months ago from from Princeton, which is about privacy fights between Europe and the US. Argument there, and I think it's right, is that we we basically say that people had known that there was surveillance happening here. You know, you have uh, Casper Bowden running around, uh, tearing his hair out, saying, you know, so you, you know, and he can't get attention. You know, so he basically, you know, so being 
pretty bitter because nobody wants to listen. He literally, he, he presents the European Parliament like this and people are guffawing at him. It's not because they think it's wrong, just because it doesn't fit in somehow. So, there, so there's a Snowden effect here, where in addition to the incredible information which Snowden provides, <coughs> which Susan has done two classic articles, which I cite to my students all the time, uh, the fact that Snowden, you know, Snowden makes this into something that states find themselves suddenly having to pay attention to in a way that they hadn't before, that there had been a diffuse understanding that they had been listened into by the United States, but it then becomes actionable in some sense because Snowden very kindly, very carefully creates a kind of, you know, and this gets back to, I guess, our work too. Trust and hypocrisy. hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that he creates an effect where it becomes impossible for states to go on being hypocritical anymore. And while I've got the floor, uh, to, so on the question of self-undermining, uh, Abe and I have this other paper, which is for the Iowa 75 uh, special issue uh, volume, which is more or less looking at how it is that the internet, you know, the global internet regime has become under, self-undermining in a variety of ways because of all of these unexpected effects at the domestic level, which I uh, guess the global, global liberalism of information flows turns out to have all sorts of uh, unexpected consequences for the domestic practice. We try to trace through how this ha happens. And on Susan's point about Goldsmith and, uh, and, and uh, Russell, uh, that's a very, it's a very interesting and provocative ar article. I think that the pushback of this, and this is something that Bruce Schneier and I have been writing about, is that it sees this from a very much standard national security perspective, you know, so it has strengths become vulnerabilities right. and so on, and it doesn't really have a very good sense of it, of what are the robust, you know, what are the possible robust aspects of democracy, what are the plausible trade-offs that we you know, and, and this is an information security argument, you want to think, you, know, you, you don't want to think about how it is that this is a national security disaster, Instead, you want to think about a situation where you have attack surfaces, which are, you know, that there's a relationship between attack surfaces and the kinds of things that you need democracy to actually be doing in terms of letting voices in. And so you want to think in a, you know, here's me, you say, you talk about trying to be a policy person uh, uh, from an information science and computer science background. We're trying, I'm trying to do the opposite here. You want to think about mitigation solutions rather than, I think, as Jack does, thinking about this as being a, a national security right. disaster. <clears throat> I, I'd, I'd like to actually just say something um, back, which is um, I don't think the, Euro the European response to Snowden was actually pay attention. Okay. Um, and uh, so I've been to any number of panels in the immediate post Snowden uh, period where there was a German and a French person on the table and they would hold forth about how terrible what the US was doing. And then I would say, wait, wasn't this package of data from the French government to the U.S. government and say, oh, yes, mumble, mumble. And weren't the Germans sending this over? Yes, mumble, yeah. mumble. So I think GDPR is looks like a response, but I don't think it's a response. I think it's an economic response. It's a way of trying to create space for the European companies to compete with uh, the U.S. companies. And I don't think it's a response to Snowden at all. Abe has a good, an article which looks specifically at GDPR and what the consequences right. are. Yeah. So the, the, anyway, the, this is a, okay. a, a one final point, just responding to Natasha, uh, which is that you're absolutely right. There's a wonderful wealth of information, politics, and literature out there. And also, I think you undersell yourself as some of the, and I are, I think that the work that you're doing on Susan Strange, uh, you know, which we kind of don't know to the kind of a, we need to say more about this. Uh, uh, this is a strange, Susan's strange world that we are entering into. But I think what weaponized interdependence, or what IR can offer to you today, is, 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 is an effort to try to explain variation. So if I think back to the uh, burn hacker and Florence, all of these articles, they're wonderful getting nitty gritty of describing what is happening, but they don't try to explain why it is that you get variation here, you know, why one thing happens here, one thing, another thing happens there. and. I think the weaponized interdependence, it's at least an effort to push in that direction. Just to build up that, and this comes back to Martin's point, is that, um, you know, I think where we want to go, and one of the things that we're really trying to explore is the role that, that institutions and norms play in when you do weaponize or don't weaponize. And one of the things, that, at least in the first cut of our paper, is how the US is very reluctant to use choke points, internet choke points, when they're facing adversaries. They're much more willing to use financial choke points, 
And so it's, you know, even though the internet governance literature says there are all these choke points, which we would agree, the political institutions and norms are making them reluctant to actually activate them. And instead they're using payment systems and these other choke points that are not actually that specific to the internet space. They're, you know, and, and that's, I think, another thing that we're trying to do in the piece is say, these things that people have looked at individually, cyber, finance, uh, uh, pro, uh, production, supply chains, that they actually are interacting. And so, you know, we need to breach out of the bubble of, of any one subsector and kind of think about these uh, interactions amongst the networks. And I think it's also a point that we try to make in our book is the way in which the information that Snowden revealed was then it allowed people to activate certain institutions. And so what's important is not necessarily you know, of course, Angela Merkel was spying on Macron. You know, it's like that all those documents reveal is like, oh, they're listening in on me. Oh, don't tell everybody that actually I'm listening on them. And and so at the elite level, we all know that. But at the at the civil society level, the information is, can then be activated in the European Court of Justice. You know, Schrems takes that information from Stone and says, look, you know, I can now use political institutions that I couldn't before because they were blocked to me because it was just hyped off as a national security issue. And so I think the Part of the interesting thing is when political institutions get involved and then these networks interact, new opportunity structures emerge. Uh, thank you so much for this interesting panel. I had, uh, I guess, one comment and then one question. One comment maybe for the table um, is that there's this great article by Brendan Green and Austin Long about covert uh, capabilities that basically looks at, and this might be useful for the authors of the original paper, um, basically, when do you reveal that you like you know about these covert technological capabilities that you have? They look at like uh, nuclear submarine tracking during the Cold War. Like, when do you you know reveal to the Soviets that you're actually able to track their submarines? Because if you reveal too soon, they're going to change their entire patterns, and you lose that. So that might be useful to look at. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the site again? Yeah, it's Austin Long and uh, Brendan Green, um, and it's like covert capabilities in nuclear deterrence or something like that. Um, on the main question. Um, in the panel, there was this kind of feeling that the, the U.S. hasn't used uh, cyber choke pay, uh, cyber choke point effects as much as they could, or um, as much as they wanted to, in maybe some cases. Um, I was curious if uh, the panel or maybe the original authors could speak to whether or not uh, does Russia and China agree that the United States hasn't used these um, cyber choke points uh, because it seems to be it doesn't quite matter quite as much if they've used them as the perception that they have used them and you get into this kind of security dilemma world where because the u.s might have capabilities and might have uh, intentions to use them in the future it then causes uh potential adversaries to then kind of find ways to get around these cyber choke point effects preemptively and that can kind of lead down to these paths where we spiral into kind of this even more weaponizing of this interdependence than we would otherwise Well, I have uh, the point about Snowden, and uh, I can yet yeah, share my vision about this. So, about Snowden, uh, the thing that after Snowden revealed the information, and uh, uh, then he moved to Russia, spent some time at the international <laughs> airport, and then uh, he's still hiding somewhere in, in Moscow. Uh, but I don't remember Snowden actually revealing some uh, provocative information that hostilities of the United States against Russia revealed a lot of information how the US government was spying on US citizens and uh, European citizens and European leaders. But the thing is, these revelations, they did not hurt American-European relations as much as they hurt Russian-American relations. This basically comes to the, well, this is my opinion. I, and I still think that uh, the Snowden was like the first sign of the fur further deterioration of Russian-American relations and uh, the first step, uh, even though back then there was no Crimea, no Ukraine, etc. Um, so basically, the Western democracies were still had a very high level of trust among each other, despite these revelations. Russian-American relations were probably not as good as they sounded. There. And about Russia and China reacting to uh, American uh, use of basically cyber capabilities. There is a very di a big difference because of the populist rhetorics that a lot of politicians, not only in Russia, uh, use today. So uh, obviously you can find a lot of opinions 
by high level Russian officials and Chinese officials, I guess, uh, accusing the United States of using some sort of weapons and whatever information um, can be used against Russia. But uh, yeah, the many of these opinions may be used not to actually accuse the United States of some hostilities in order to further, uh, I don't know, to do something in international relations or in bilateral relations, rather than be used to address the public opinion in Russia and to uh, um, form it against any foreign adversary in order to uh, do something in Russia. Uh, I'm not sure about China. China is, uh, is a mystery for me. I'm not sure. uh, try, to, try to understand what. Uh, China and in, in, in Russia, I think this reflects my point that Russia, at least, is trying to make Internet and information resources a national asset, while the United States consider cyberspace as a global domain and basically try to use the existing domain as to take advantage of it somehow, but not to nationalize it in any way. Yeah. One comment that I'd like to make is that uh, it seems to me that uh, theme of this discussion uh, was that there's a difference between public and private uh, reaction to these events and a lot of times countries use their public reactions to influence their domestic for whatever reasons they want. Yeah, I just wanted to make two points about China. So we have, um, you know, the United States through the USTR taking um, very strong moves to influence Alibaba, the Taobao marketplace and its sale of counterfeit goods with strong domestic pressure from rights holders of intellectual property. So we have the, the United States there trying to shape the governance system of uh, one of the, the, the biggest e-commerce platforms in China, Alibaba, and Alibaba making reforms in order that the Taobao marketplace could get off the US TR's uh, blacklist, special 301 blacklist. But uh, just this week, we see with the, the row over um, uh, the criticism of treatment of Hong Kong protesters within the NBA that uh, Houston basketball team, Rockets, Rockets basketball team. And then we see a reaction by um, an Alibaba co-founder who um, looks like through through pressure removed the sale of goods from Alibaba. So the, 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 the pressure China has now is this massive domestic uh, marketplace system that is a real um, uh, stick that it can use to threaten Western rights holders. And when we see the number of uh, Western companies that line up and apologize for any perceived criticism or insult or acknowledgement of, of Taiwan, China really is able to use its market power in a, in a different way by um, th through the use of this online marketplace. If you if you dare criticize, you know, your, your goods could be downranked or even disappear from this marketplace, which could be a, a significant economic penalty for, for companies. But of course, China's actually been using its marketplace in a but a way long before that, with the requirement that uh, that software sold in China has to be given in source code to the government, mm -hmm. which enables then the Chinese government to use it in any way it wants, in particular to then give it and, and copy it. Mm -hmm. So that um, that's a very coercive power mm -hmm. that the Chinese government has exercised mm -hmm. for probably a decade now. Let's take two questions here and there. This is really very interesting that uh, the paper in the comments. So what's distinctive about this area is the proliferation of actors that are capable of doing weaponized interdependence, right? The finance is really what the US could do, at least at this point. You know, Susan's point was about the vulnerabilities of, of, of the United States. And it's not even just the major powers, the US, Russia, China, it's North Korea, it's Iran, you know, and, and then Natasha's point, it's a lot of private actors, right? Who whether they're authorized or arm's length from the state of which they're part or they're on their own, right? Um, the question really is getting prescriptive about that. I and mean, this is really the reason we're trying to understand what by independence is to have a better analytic understanding of the dynamics so that we can also maybe try to figure out ways to manage it. That. That's always why we study things, right? And there have been all these efforts, right? There was the, oh, let's do, you know, let's use the deterrence model, right? Well, no, maybe not. Let's use the arms control model. Well, you know, 
very complicated. You know, you think maybe let's use the Paris Climate Accord where you have you know international standards and, and, and national levels of meeting them. And none of those seem to fit. And this is not my here, but but what are some ideas that folks on the panel have or you know maybe jumping ahead for a for Abe and Henry about prescriptively what what kinds of mechanisms or strategies or norms or rules processes could be used by the international community to you know contain reduce the prospects of cyber leading to escalated conflicts it's a premature question to ask actually because um the u.s is so far not willing China and Russia are so far not willing to play that that Iran and North Korea are not willing to play in Israel are less of an issue, but that China, Russia, and the US are not willing to um, makes it very hard to come up with any kind of an agreement. This discussion has been around 10 years and the US has not participated in any of it in any serious way. And I guess the only thing I say that is one of our roles is to try to think these through these things through. Smaller scale issues, you can think of the landmines treaty, you know, which was which was initiated by an NGO. I mean, all of the part of our research is to get ideas out there that are not, you know, that we think have the possibility so that when states start to pay attention, there's been some efforts to you know, intellectually and practically develop some ideas and debate them because, you know, people started out, oh, is this deterrence? Well, not really. You know? So, so let me, uh, I, I guess I would say this. I mean, so there have been conversations going on at least, at least since, you know, 2004 or something. Uh, in the 90s, Russia introduced a treaty at the UN about this, and that didn't go anywhere. Um, but then there's, there have there been, uh, interestingly, sort of path dependence plays a role here, right? This started out in the first committee at the UN armament issue, which has effects for the way a lot of global level conversations about what should be the rules of the road have happened because they've had this securitized focus, um, which is sits somewhat uneasily with the sort of business activity that we've been discussing in this room, right? that if it's a disarmament discussion, the fact that private sector owns 95% of the networks is doesn't fit real well. Um, but that discussion, they, there, there was some progress, right? So there are these GGE meetings, the 2013 and the 2015 GGEs set out 11 kind of, they called them norms, uh, understandings, and they're really basic stuff. Like it took them a long time to get to the point where we agree that international law applies in digital space. I mean, the idea that this is a breakthrough, it is a breakthrough that because this was deeply contested. Um, and, and there's how firmly rooted these agreements are is we'll see how they roll like any other kind of normativity. Yeah, there's some fragility there. But after the 2017 GGE came to no agreement and people were wringing their hands and despairing. Another GGE. And there's now a, it's a uh, Nadia put this in her marching orders to us. She wanted us to raise it, so I'll raise it. I mean that um, <laughs> that the one of the the GGE structure in the United Nations is it is a group of government experts acting in their individual capacities, um, and who gets to sit? What nationality? Even though they're in their individual capacities, you'll be shocked shocked to know that states actually really care about having their nationals on these things. Uh, so who gets to sit is always an interesting dance. Um, then the Russians uh, have set up uh, an alternative track and said, we're going to have an open group. Who wants to come, can come. Is that, I mean, that's they, loosely they extended the authority of the GGE to a, yeah. Exactly. So, but there are these, now these sort of two tracks. And yes. I think the open-ended group has actually met at least once and they're sort of getting their act together. I'm not sure that the GGE process has actually gotten off the ground for the next round, but <clears throat> how, so it's not that nothing, you know, nothing's happened. There's also Mike Schmidt has this Tallinn manuals one and two. They're doing this for the laws of war, right? Trying to figure out what that transposition might look like, how much bite that's going to have. Again, it's like all other proposals for international rules, whether they stick or not depends a lot on 
things that are hard to anticipate, but, but there's activity. But here's what's missing in the discussion. There is of talk without understanding the tech. And yes. the tech, oh, yeah. Absolutely. if you don't understand the tech, so we heard all about Cyber Pearl Harbor. For a decade, we heard about Cyber Pearl Harbor. That didn't make any sense, because that's an act of war. Uh, and if you do that, we know what reaction, what, what, what the response will be. Information warfare was not anticipated. At some point, we'll have to do a Pearl Harbor Commission on that, but we're we're not there at this point. But what are the kinds of acts that could happen that are not information warfare, that are not cyber Pearl Harbor, that, that need responses or don't need responses? We haven't had these tech <coughs> people in the room aiming at the tech level, not at the policy level, but at the tech level. And until you have that, you have a complete disconnect. That I think also feeds into this question about how state national governments are staffing their the, the bureaucratic entities that send people to these interstate conferences. So Marty wanted me to, she actually did this deliberately. I think I'm going to advertise that we're starting an MS program in cybersecurity yeah. and public policy. <laughs> it won't be at the level of a GG, but thank you. Thank you. Taking people from different backgrounds, right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. And teaching them the different things. Okay. I have. Yes. Me? Yes. Okay. And then, and then the, Natasha. And then Natasha. Oh, sorry. The, the point about Cyber Pearl Harbor, I was thinking about it. The fact that Cyber Pearl Harbor had, didn't happen, is it a, rea a result of a an effective policies? Or is it uh, just because it is a very hardly probability situation that can happen? Um, you do a Cyber Pearl Harbor, that's an act of war. Yes, we know sure. how to respond to an act of war. It's what you do below the act of war that we don't know how to respond to. Yeah, well, I, I think I was not clear about this point in my presentation that um, since the governments and the national governments react in a different way to the uh, cyber challenges in cyberspace, <laughs> uh, the responsibility of the governments, each government is different. And whenever we talk about the global internet governance system, Governments can contribute to this global system only to the extent that they have within their national authorities. This is very different in Russia and the United States. I'm most interested. Uh, I can share you the uh, project that uh, ranking Russian foreign minister, uh, foreign uh, servicemen uh, told me that uh, at some point there was a discussion about the negotiations between Russia and the United States about non-targeting critical infrastructures, which is just reasonable thing to do, not to target hospitals, I don't know, things like this. And he said, like, okay, we can make a declaration and just put a lot of efforts to make the two presidents shake hands and say, like, okay, we're not targeting the critical infrastructure. But when we start actually doing the technical work and uh, we would have to share a lot of information that we don't want to share with each other. That's why these uh, agreements cannot go further than just political declarations. Which is a good thing, but won't guarantee anything at all. But in fact, one can begin to think about ways you would implement some of that at a technical level. Not perfectly, but, but there are ways to think about that. But that's the kind of lower level I'm talking about, going from talking about cyber Pearl Harbor and information warfare gritty and that becomes technical issues as well as policy issues but you got to have the techies in the room yeah and another thing is that cyber probably is not the key word here particularly if you have a cyber for harbor, for harbor there would be an actor who would have a motivation to do that and there can be a lot of political work done before this actor appears and has this motivation is to dissuade him to prevent him understand this is not a cyber issue but a political issue. There's a tool some, here. Some, something I should not be saying at the cyber panel. But <laughs> <laughs> well, but we're coming to the end of the cyber panel, so it's time to transition. Let's hear a comments from Natasha and then questions from John. So um, in, in response to your question, um, slow movements too in regards to how states should treat platforms, regard platforms. There's the uh, set of Manila principles, 2014, Santa Clara principles in 2018. So these are broad ranging, like you say, efforts to set some norms. And they're pretty 
pretty base level that uh, governments should use formal legal orders. Governments should um, accept, and platforms should use proportionate responses, not taking down an entire website for one act of infringement or one violation of a policy. So we're at the beginning stages. Also, the Internet Governance Forum is a, is a, a popular area of policy making and of, of discussion. And uh, French President Emmanuel Macron at the uh, November 2018 a conference called for different models of internet governance. So he kind of said, you know, there's the, the US California style of free market laissez faire, uh, light touch regulation, a Chinese model of heavy authoritarian state led regulation, and maybe there's a different model that the EU is human rights based organization kind of pushing that out. So he called for moving beyond these kind of simplistic models and, and to something else what that might be and what that might look like is a fertile area for future research a quick fabulous panel learn so much wrong for you um to to sum up what what i would offer very quickly and then i'll have two questions is the distinction between public and private is important but the distinction between military and civilian is also extremely important and that's something that's bothered me about this idea of weaponized interdependence because there are cyber weapons and just because they haven't been used doesn't mean they're not. I mean, it's pretty clear the United States Navy is preparing to fight a war with China and maybe Russia, right? That's that's its that's its motivating. It's been told by the boss that's what you have to prepare for, right? Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but we're spending tremendous resources and we're devoting most of our effort towards that goal. And so one of the things that's fascinating about this, and I'll get to the question very quickly, is how much of an analogy there is to sort of theories of, of naval coercion and naval combat. And this idea that like the Navy has time and wartime missions, right? This idea that, you know, we sail around the world and we keep the sea lanes open, we show the flag, we make sure commerce continues and we do naval diplomacy. And then every once in a while, we'll park an aircraft carrier on some poor country and throw some ordnance at it. But then there's this idea of like, then there's the big battle, right? There's there's the actual big fleet on fleet engagement where you're actually, you know, you're, you're having a very bad time, right? And the, the idea is you actually can't build a fleet to do both. Right? You have to choose. Like there's a zero sum trade off. And you could do your peacetime operation. It could be competitive peacetime. You, you could be competing with China and Russia and, and have a certain type of fleet. And this gets to uh, Dan's point like, why are we using some, why are we using Panopticon more than we're using coercion and we're not using weapons at all? Right? Because there is this spectrum of conflict. So the question I have for you guys is twofold. One is, is this a zero sum trade off in the fact that like some countries might be optimizing their cyber capability strictly for this weapon weaponized, literally weaponized activity that we don't see is what Susan was talking about. Um, or is, is, is it so cheap that you can do both? That's a really important policy distinction. And the second one is it's pretty clear that the United States military, like every other aspect of policy, has an outsized role compared to other countries, it seems to me. What are the implications for the various national variations of who is in charge of this whole process? Because obviously a military is biased towards the schwacking side of things rather than the surveillance and um, side of things. Any other questions that somebody in the audience just to collect one more? Yes. Um, Susan, I love your comment about tech right. being understood. But I was very curious about the example you gave, the um, cyber Pearl Harbor um, being an example of tech being misunderstood. It seemed like the point you were making is that the, what was misunderstood is the law and context, that that would be an act of war, therefore we would know how to respond to it. Isn't the whole point that we want to prevent that from happening in the future? Require something below that. So my point about cyber Pearl Harbor is that we heard that rhetoric for a decade and it was not a plausible rhetoric was talked about as if it could happen without a, a real war, as if we would have a cyber Pearl Harbor and we wouldn't launch and nuclear only a cyber and, 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 and nothing else. There wouldn't be any other war. It would just be cyber Pearl Harbor attack on us and everything else. You know, the planes would still go off to, to Europe <laughs> and to, to South America and, and to Russia and China and everything. But we would just have cyber. That, that's not complete nonsense. Cyber Pearl Harbor was an act of war and, and the lack of, of the the way we were talking about cyber Pearl Harbor and then we had information warfare and not thinking about all sorts of low level other things that could be attacks without rising to 
the level of and how do we handle those and those haven't been part of the discussion that was my point there and that would be the way to Let's just let's yeah. Let's just take time to answer John's questions and also provide any concluding remarks. I'll take a quick whack at John uh, Jonathan's question, which is, I mean, the diversity of uh, one of the things I was trying to get at is that the diversity of where you park these issues in your domestic institutions is vast and deeply path dependent in some interesting random ways, right? So some places it's in you know. It, how did the U.S. Department of Commerce become the go-to place, for example, for a lot of this? Also, how it's distributed across. So the United States is so big, stuff going on in commerce. We've got now we've got Cyber Command, which we didn't have for a long time. And there's all kinds of things going on. Um, but in other countries, sometimes it's in the Prime Minister's office. Sometimes it's in. And for a lot of countries, this is an economic problem and they're all worried about cyber weapons. So it's in the Treasury office or something else because it's about revenue. So the, <clears throat> the, the, the structures are highly varied, which potentially creates some interesting problems trying to coordinate and negotiate cross nationally about what the rules should be because you have domestic bureaucracies whose missions in life are quite different and whose understandings of what the national interest here is are quite different. If you've parked these issues in a military space, you're going to get negotiators with one set of priors. If you park it in the Treasury Department, you're going to get different sets of, of priors. So, so I think this is important to think about. And um, I have not seen super good work on this, and I'd love to read some if somebody knows who's done good work. We'll just add to Marnie's point about commerce versus other. So the parking in the US of civilian cybersecurity in commerce has been true since actually the 1960s and reaffirmed in the 1980s, but well underfunded. Now it's had very positive effects. The uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology does develops crypto standards that are used internationally and that's good for US business, use, good for US commerce, um, uh, good for security around the world. On the other hand, the vast underfunding, I don't think would happen if it were in a more military-like agency or more defense no type of the United States. Right, you and want, there's- you want um, something <laughs> right. right, right. So um, there is an acknowledgement, there's been constant acknowledgements that it's underfunded, but it hasn't, there've been changes. You know, I would say it's probably increased a thousand percent from 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's still nowhere near where it needs to be. I just wanted to, I think it, um, there's a lot of great complementary research agendas that can, can attach on either side of weaponized interdependence. And this goes back to Dan's point of, you know, founding the idea. And at least in, I think in uh, Hemi's, uh, in our mind, you know, it's really about when states use private networks for geostrategic ends, when they're trying to get their state objectives by using these private networks. And I think in the conversation, and this will happen, I think, over and over, there's two other situations where states use state networks, you know, mil military uses military networks in cyber, for example, or in other domains. And then the other is when states use course events against private actors for not strategic interests. So I'm thinking about like U.S. and gambling. You know, we use our network power all the time to try to close economic opportunities or promote economic opportunities. They're just kind of kind of those two other research agendas are complementary to this one. But at least what we're focusing on is how states use these private networks for for strategic ends. Natasha, would you like to? Just a short comment that uh, this uh, um, opposing government versus private networks that works in the United States, but doesn't work in <laughs> Russia. For example, we have in Russia our own huge email provider, huge search engine, which is, well, in Russia as popular as Google or Yahoo. But the government does not own them, still has a lot of influence on them. They don't use them as the American government uses Facebook, for example, or Google or any other. So this is much more complicated than that. All right, let's thank our discussion for an excellent